In this video, we're going to look at the core themes of nationalism. Uh, nationalism is said to have really emerged in Europe uh, with the onset of the French Revolution in the late 18th century. And it's something we'll come back and look at in more detail when we're looking at the strands of nationalism. But to discuss nationalism initially, um, a starting point could be to look at the map of Europe in 1815 really at the end of the French revolutionary process and the defeat of revolutionary France at Waterloo. And if you look at a map of Europe at that time, we can identify probably nine of what we might call now nation states um, or distinctive nations, such as Sweden, Norway, France itself, Spain, Portugal and Great Britain. With the rest of the map of Europe, consisting of a number of small principalities and also these great dynastic states or autocratic states, which were multinational and multi-ethnic, the Austrian Empire, um, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire. Um, if we jump on to 100 years later, 1914, on the eve of the First World War, we can see that some progress has been made with increasing pressure of nationalists in the preceding 100 years. And now we have about 16 distinctive nation states in Europe, with these dynastic states slowly giving way to the emergence of nation states. We can see now a, a unified Germany, some people call it a German empire at the start of 1914, still the Austria-Hungarian empire, the Russian empire, and the Ottoman empire, which is the first of the big empires to really decay. And it's at the fringes of the Ottoman empire that some of these nation states begin to emerge like Romania and Bulgaria. If you move on then to the aftermath of the First World War in 1922, we can see the emergence of really a Europe of full nation states. Um, this is very much prompted by the belief of liberal nationalists such as Woodrow Wilson that the pre-war multinational and multi-ethnic um, dynastic states were, were unstable and militaristic. And when the war was over, uh, there was the attempt to uh, get rid of these dynastic multinational states and redraw the map to show a Europe of independent nation states. Um, it was thought that these independent nation states would be stable and peaceful and friendly towards each other. Didn't quite work out like that, but you get some idea of what the modern map of Europe looks like, a uh, Europe of independent nation states. Um, the next big um, rush towards nationalism really comes after the Second World War, um, particularly with the ending of the great colonial empires of, of Britain and France, and in, particularly in Africa. You can have a look at the map of colonial Africa in the early 20th century, ruled by largely <coughs> by these European powers. But then <coughs> in the post-colonial area and the ending of colonialism in the Second World War, you now see the map of Africa again as a, as a continent of independent nation states. And the final big rush towards nationalism was the breakup of the, the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War. And this is in effect the current map of Europe with several more nation states being added to this map of Europe. Although the process of nationalism is still going on, I mean, the Crimea um, is still very much in the news down here in Eastern Ukraine. So the current map of Europe, a map of what we will call independent nation states, um, all created or driven by the uh, concept or ideology of, of nationalism. Nationalism as a definition then is the belief that the nation is or should be the central principle of political organization, not multi-ethnic, not multinational empires or dynasties, but a nation. And this uh, belief that it should be the central principle of political organization is based on two assumptions. One, that humankind, or the world, or humankind is naturally divided up into distinct nations. And secondly, that the nation is the most appropriate and perhaps the only legitimate unit of political rule. However, nationalism is broader than a simple belief that the nation is the natural and proper unit of government. It does contain a number of interrelated ideas and values, what we call the core themes, which combined demonstrate that nationalism is an ideology in its own right. And these core themes are the nation, organic community, self-determination and culturalism. 
the nation or how to define uh, a nation. Well, at a basic level, nations can be defined as a collection of people who are bound together by a, a common culture. And culture in its broadest sense could include shared values and traditions, often with a common language or a common religion, a common history, and they usually occupy the same geographical area. These can be seen as the objective factors, things you can point to and say, yes, we can see those particular factors. But by themselves, they are not enough to help us define a nation, because many nations might have a common language, but some nations will have several languages. Some nations might have a dominant religion, some might have several religions, some might have no religion, be entirely secular. Um, so by themselves, these objective factors are not enough to define a nation. And there is a second, what we call a subjective factor. And the subjective factor is a sentiment or a psychological attachment to one's nation. So ultimately, to define a nation, a nation is a psychopolitical or a psychocultural entity, a group of people who regard themselves as a natural political community and who are also bound together by a shared loyalty or affection, sometimes referred to as patriotism, literally a love of one's country. However, there are competing ideas about um, nationalism in the nation. Uh, one idea is a vision of political or civic nationalism. It's a form of nationalism that regards the nation as a political community, usually expressed the idea of self-determination. And this political or civic nationalism lies within traditions of rationalism and liberalism. And in contrast to other ideas of nationalism, such as ethnic nationalism, members of the political nation are seen as voluntary and based on citizenship and it's linked to the acceptance of civic values or political values regarding, regardless of origin, culture, religion, etc. As such, it's an inclusive form of nationalism, highlights the importance of civil or civic or political bonds. As such, nations may be multiracial or multi-ethnic or multi-religious or multicultural. Examples of this could be America, uh, which is certainly a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious um, nation uh, bound together by a common political civic allegiance. United Kingdom as well, multinational state, Scots, Welsh, Irish and English, but bound together by a common political or civic allegiance. But this kind of political or civic nationalism can often blur the distinction between what is a nation and what is a state. An alternative form of nationalism would be cultural nationalism. And it's a form of nationalism that places primary emphasis on the regeneration of the nation as a distinctive civilization, rather than on self-government or the political community or civic values. And cultural nationalism seeks to promote cultural unity by focusing on a defense of or a strengthening of cultural bonds rather than political bonds. A third type of nationalism closely related to cultural nationalism is ethnic nationalism. And again, this is fueled by a keen sense of ethnic distinctiveness, which might include a common language or faith or common ethnic ancestry. As such, the nation is defined in terms of ethnicity and the desire to preserve it. As it's not possible to join an ethnic group, ethnic nationalism, similar to cultural nationalism, is an exclusive form of nationalism and can often overlap with racialism. And these can blur the distinction between nations and races, which we'll see later is, is, are different. Unlike political nationalism, both cultural and ethnic nationalism are exclusive organic concepts often associated with right-wing nationalism. And because cultural and ethnic nationalism are closely linked and overlap, they're often referred to as a single entity of ethno-cultural nationalism. Examples of ethno-cultural nationalism or cultural nationalism could be Hindu nationalism, currently very strong in India, represented by the BJP party. English nationalism, Englishness is often defined by extreme right-wing groups such as the BNP as being solely concentrated on English values, particularly, of course, white English as well. Or another example of cultural nationalism could be Irish nationalism as it emerged in the late 19th century focused around a resurgence of Gaelic or distinctly Irish games, the Irish language uh, and Irish arts as well. The second core theme is that of organic community. 
and all nationalists agree that nations are organic communities with humankind naturally divided into a collection of nations, each possessing a distinctive character and separate identity. As such, the bonds of nationhood as an ideology are stronger than those of class for socialists or gender for feminists or religion or language. But different explanations have been put forward for the emergence of and the endurance of these bonds within this organic community. One explanation for the endurance and emergence of these bonds is the nation as a primordialist um, emergence. Primordialism suggests that nations emerged from ancient deep-seated communities and that national identity is historically embedded. Primordialists would argue that nationalism is the result of humans' evolutionary tendency to gather and unite in groups. Smith argues that there's a clear link between pre-modern communities, which he called ethnies or prototype nations, and modern nations. And the key change was when these ethnies or proto-nations became linked to the emerging doctrine of political sovereignty. Smith very much focused on the positive and progressive aspects of nationalism. Uh, a second um, argument as to what the bonds are within these organic communities is called uh, modernist or situationist. We look at a map of the UK in 1801, still very much largely a rural country, and then look at it 50 years later after industrialization and urbanization where a new kind of society has emerged. And writers like Gellner has linked the emergence of nationalization to this huge sea change of modernization, especially industrialization and urbanization. And this emergence of a new form of industrial society, socially mobile, self-striving, competition, required a new source of social cohesion, which took the form of, of nationalism. Again, Anderson is another uh, situationist or modernist, and he calls nations imagined communities. We only ever meet a small fraction of the other people that we share the same nationality with. And he stresses the importance of particularly modern mass communications in maintaining those bonds. Uh, a third argument for the nation as organic community is called the constructivists. People like Hobsbawm would argue that nations are merely a bundle of invented traditions with invented anthems and flags and extension of education that nationalism was used merely as a device through which the ruling class diffused socialist revolution by ensuring national loyalty was stronger than class loyalty. The third core theme is that of nationalism as self-determination. Uh, nationalism emerged when this idea of a national community encountered the doctrine of popular sovereignty. Rousseau was seen as the father of modern nationalism when he expressed the idea of the general will, that people should be ruled by the general will, the genuine interests of the collective body equivalent to the common good. Influenced by Rousseau during the French Revolution, it was asserted by the revolutionaries that people were um, citizens possessed of inalienable rights and no longer subjects of a monarch. And this was translated into the rule of the people, what we now call popular sovereignty, the vision of a people or nation governing itself. The nation then was not just a natural community, but a natural political community. In this tradition, nationalism is focused on the principle of self-determination, attaining or maintaining political independence through the founding of a nation state. And a nation state is when the boundaries of the nation coincide with the boundaries of the state. And this idea of a nation state offers the prospect of both cultural cohesion and political unity nationality and citizenship coincide. There are a number of ways in which nations can achieve self-determination. One is through unification, the process by which a collection of separate entities, usually sharing the same cultural characteristics, are integrated into a single state. For example, Germany emerges from the unification of a variety of states under Bismarck. Um, Italy is unified uh, under Mazzini. A second way in which nations can achieve self-determination is through independence, the process through which a nation is liberated from foreign rule, usually to the establishment of sovereign statehood. An example could be India in 47, or the Republic of Ireland in 1922, following the, the Easter Rising in 1916. A third way of achieving self-determination is through separatism, 
the quest to secede from a larger political formation with the view to establishing an independent state. For example, the Basque separatists in northern Spain or the Kurdish nation, which overlaps with several other nations, or indeed um, Scotland and the recent referendum. The final core theme is that of nationalism as culturalism. Cultural nationalism emphasizes, as we've seen, the strengthening of national identity over political demands, stressing the regeneration of the nation as a distinctive civilization. Whereas political nationalism tends to be rational and inclusive, cultural nationalism tends to be mystical and exclusive. If Rousseau is seen as the father of political nationalism, well then Johann Herder is seen as the father of cultural nationalism. Herder believed that each nation possessed a Volksgeist, a spirit or organic identity of the people, often reflected in their culture, especially their language, but perhaps their environment and climate as well. Herder's nationalism was a form of culturalism, whereby we are culturally defined creatures. Our culture is the basis for our personal and social identity. Fichte also argued that an awareness and appreciation of national traditions and collective memories was crucial. Cultural nationalism can be seen as exclusive, as there is a strong overlap between culture and ethnicity. As it's not possible to join an ethnic group, ethnic and cultural nationalism is clearly an exclusive character, tends to overlap with racialism. Often termed, as we mentioned before, ethno-cultural nationalism, this can be hostile towards other nations or minority groups. So there are four core themes of nationalism. Nationalism itself can be defined as the belief that the nation is or should be the central principle of political organization. This is based on two core assumptions. Humankind is naturally divided into distinct nations and the nation is the most appropriate and perhaps the only legitimate unit of political rule. But nationalism is broader than just the simple belief that a nation is the natural and proper unit of government and it has a number of interrelated core themes, which combined demonstrate that it is an ideology in its own right. And those core themes always have seen the nation, organic community, self-determination and culturalism. <laughs>